for joining us today and, and also for our hosts today. It's nice to have this involvement with a whole broad variety of hosts for Roundtail Moth Awareness Month. I do want to acknowledge that I, I have a great team behind me, um, including Tom Schmelk, who is our uh, entomologist who runs the Brown Tail Moth Program, as well as other folks within the Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry, within Maine CDC, and also within Cooperative Extension. So this is my first presentation, aside from a legislative hearing, on uh, Brown Tail Moth during Brown Tail Moth Awareness Month. So I'm a little bit rusty, but um, hopefully, hopefully things will go well. And we talk a lot about brown tail moth, and most of us did not get into um, forest entomology because we love um, these insects that cause, you know, really uh, impactful uh, human irritations as well as uh, damage to our trees. We got into this field more because of love for the natural resources or the natural world. And um, one of the things that you know, we try to drive home is that, you know, there's a real um, broad diversity of insects in the state. There's more than 20,000 species of insects known in Maine and more arriving every day. Um, and that also most of those, those insects are actually beneficial to us. They're playing important roles in the environment and are not pest species. And those insects need to be top of mind when we think about how we respond to brown tail moth and other pest species um, because our responses can harm those beneficial insects. And so I do want to give just a brief history of brown tail moth that is a caterpillar that was introduced into the Somerville, Massachusetts area in the late 1800s. Um, it was established in Maine by 1904 and the species really quickly expanded after that initial introduction. Um, you know, by the 19 teens, it was found across much of New England, uh, Maritime Canada, and also parts of New York. But a population collapse began by the 1920s. And by the mid 1970s, when um, Paul Schaefer was doing his PhD work on brown tail moth, many believed that it would remain a minor problem of the islands and the coasts. They, nobody really foresaw this expansion that we're seeing today at that point. However, by the 1980s, there were mainland populations here in Maine. And by 1994, we were, through our aerial surveys, mapping damage from the pest. And we've mapped it annually. Uh, since then, we've never had populations below 400 acres or areas mapped below 400 acres since 1994. We did have, and I don't know if you see there, my cursor. <laughs> we did have an outbreak that peaked in 2003, that peaked at just under 11,000 acres. And folks who were in the Casco Bay region probably remember that outbreak well and think it was a pretty big outbreak. And then in 2010, we saw the indications that this population was building again. But then we had a period of time when the populations were suppressed, probably due to wet springs. Um, and we didn't really see that outbreak begin to build again in 2000, until 2015, where it really began to take off in earnest. And even in 2015, you can see that we were nearly matching what we had seen at the peak of the last outbreak in 2010. And now we are almost at 200,000 acres of damage mapped in 2021. And so it really has taken off. And I, I will note there's a link in the slide that says map here. And I've provided a PDF uh, through the Blue Hill Heritage Trust. And that link should be live within the PDF. So if folks want to review it later, um, they, they can. So why did we do Brown Tail Moth Awareness Month? I mean, one of the reasons is we get a lot of calls from folks who Basically, their summers had been ruined because they didn't recognize brown tail moth in their yard in time to do something about it. And a lot of times those folks will have just a few ornamental trees in their yard that could easily, where the brown tail moth populations could easily be managed. 
Other times the populations are higher and it's not that easy a solution. A lot of times there are not good solutions for brown tail moths, but we do need more people to participate in mitigating the problem of brown tail moths. And we need your help to, to spread the word about it, educate neighbors, and encourage community action. And we also wanted to use this opportunity to encourage folks to plan for the conditions that they will encounter in May and June. So why should I care? Looking through those comments that folks shared early on, I think many of you know, but the reason that we care about brown tail moth is really about those irritating hairs. They have a um, barbed surface where they will get into the skin, pierce the skin, and they also have a toxin within them. They are hollow hairs that have a toxin. Some people are not affected by brown tail moth hairs, some, some lucky folks, but many people are. And a lot of times, or sometimes folks will re uh, report that they have reaction to the hairs with as few as 10 webs per tree. So really low density populations can cause uh, that discomfort. And the reason that we're talking about this now is that it provides some time for advanced planning. There is no reason to wait until February to plan for how you're going to manage brown tail moth the following year, but February gives you some time to reach out if you're going to do that, to clip webs before the caterpillars break dormancy. You know, th this picture here, the caterpillars on it are warming up in the spring. It was taken in mid-April last year. And so you really need you to, if you're going to be clipping webs, do that before mid-April. And so we've been promoting these four R's for Brown Tail Moth Awareness Month. They are recognize, remove, recruit, and reach out. And I'll go through each of those in a little bit more detail. And I, I hesitate to put this up here, but you know it is important when you're dealing with a, a pet species and trying to manage it to understand a little bit about its life cycle. And so let me just move some stuff around on the screen here. Um, which is, this is just a year in the life of brown tail moths. Right now we're in winter. The caterpillars will spend the winter in webs that were formed in autumn and they are dormant in those webs, but they're ready to come out in the spring as soon as temperatures warm and you'll see them out sunning themselves on the webs in warm spring days. They're really very social at this point. They're actually reliant on their sibling group at this point. Um, if you separate them from each other, they don't do well. Um, and they will feed in these sort of really social clusters for a, a fair amount of April and also early May. But by late May, sometimes earlier if food is in short supply, but by late May, they start to wander. And that's when people really begin to encounter their hairs. And they will continue to wander and feed through June. And then in June, they pupate and you get these cocoons that also have a lot of the toxic hairs in them. The adults, usually we see our first adult emergence around the 4th of July and peak is usually around mid-July. It's all weather dependent though. The adults will come out, they'll mate and the females will lay eggs on the undersides of host leaves. And then in late summer, the eggs hatch, the larvae begin to feed communally again in those sibling groups. And as they're feeding, they build their overwintering webs. So the webs, they tend to be towards, well, they're in hardwood trees. Their, their uh, hosts are fruit trees, your rosaceae family, so apples and cherries, service berries, hawthorns, roses, things like that. Also oaks, but they are not really picky eaters. So they'll also get into things like elms, birches, even maples sometimes especially when they're in higher populations, but their primary, their, their favored trees are really those oaks and the fruit trees. The webs tend to be on the upper and outer portion of the crown, but if you're familiar with fruit trees, you know that they have a lot of spur branches. And so sometimes we see webs on the tips of branches in the interior of the crown. You could see webs almost anywhere in Maine where there are host trees. Um, last year, we didn't have any detections in York County, but York County has certainly had um, defoliating populations in the past. And the other thing that we want folks to be aware of is that 
There are some things that look like brown tail moth, and in particular, one that has suffered from our reaction to brown tail moth, or one group that has suffered from our reaction to brown tail moth, are the silk moths. And overwintering silk moth cocoons can look similar to the overwintering webs of brown tail moth. And so what I have here is a side-by-side -side look at the two, uh, well, actually two species, not the two species. Um, uh, in orange is the brown tail moth. And actually these two pictures came from the same tree. They're a cherry tree in uh, Eddington. And you can see that the winter web of brown tail moth, there's often multiple attachments. They have these bright white silk tying them to the twigs of the host trees. This is something that we tell people to look for. It's almost always fairly obvious, although you know, as things weather a little bit, it might not be as bright. And then on the silk moth, you have just a single leaf encompassed in the web, which sometimes you have a brown tail moth, as you can see down below. And it is also tied to the branch, but the silk is of a different consistency. So as you, you start to look at brown tail moth, you'll be able to tell the two apart. And you can see there's very vast differences in the caterpillars and also in the adults. And these silk moths are, are like the, they're the charismatic megafauna of our um, moth species here in Maine. And they, they, have, um, they have declined due to introductions of biological control for uh, gypsy moth and also brown tail moth in the um, early part of their invasion of, uh, in North America. So as far as what can you do for recognize during Brown Tail Moth Awareness Month and also in the month of March, it's not too, too late to do it in March, is to organize a winter web survey in your community. And we encourage folks to do this. Um, you know, you can have lunchtime walks at work or education of student and staff at schools and also importantly around your own home. So we, we do encourage folks to to really be active in this Brown Tail Moth Awareness Month activity, because you may be hearing it from us, but not everybody is, and you can help us to spread the information and save people's summers. Moving on to the second R, remove. You want to remove webs with permission, but also with an eye to safety. We, we don't want folks to, to remove webs that are outside of what they can safely do. For instance, if you have to get off the ground to remove webs or are there overhead hazards such as widow makers or power lines, or if there's heavy traffic, you might wanna reach out to a professional for help. To the, destroy the webs, I recommend burning them. Um, that's what I tend to do when I clip webs. Um, for outdoor burning, you may need a permit, but there are some exceptions. I do tend to just burn them in my wood stove. I get a five gallon pail and we have a big wood stove downstairs and I'll just throw them right in there. I've also burned them in the sugaring arch um, and also warming fires outdoors, especially during the pandemic. Um, it's a good, good way to get together with friends and, and just um, also take care of a problem. You can also destroy them by soaking them in a bucket of soapy water. Um, it needs to be for a long time though. Like we recommend at least overnight and several days to be safe. And then also at that point, you may want to dispose of them in the trash as opposed to like composting them or something like that. Uh, this is just a picture of what I have for my web clipping kit. I tell you, I would not have gotten that pruner if I had to do it over again. I, I do like it, it's light. My nine-year-old can use it, um, but it doesn't get as high as I would like to get. Um, so you want to make sure that you have uh, safety gear, you know, think about protecting your skin and your eyes. And if you are particularly sensitive to the hairs, you may want to have somebody else do this. You might want, not want to take part in this activity, even though the webs do not have uh, as potent hairs as the rest of the caterpillar life or others of the lot caterpillar life stages. We find that it's a lot easier to work with a partner. And oh, I have duct tape on the list as well, because if you do get hairs uh, in your skin, you can try to remove them with duct tape immediately upon noticing that you have them. I also like to carry a large bucket to put the webs in. I found that's easiest. I've tried things like a tote bag or um, a pack basket, and I found that the five gallon pail really works the best for me. Um, I like to have 
hand snips, loppers, and pole pruners. Um, although just two is better if you don't have a partner to help you. When the snow is on the ground, it's really easy to track those webs and pick them up. Um, put them in the bucket. If the bucket gets full, I recommend using a lawn and leaf bag to collect them because you don't have to deal with the plastic of like a trash bag or something like that. So again, looking back at Brown Tail Moth Awareness Month, we encourage folks to organize some web clipping activities within your communities, whether it's your place of employment, your school, or someplace else. And I'd encourage you to, to make it fun. You know, throw down a challenge to a neighboring town or land trust or, you know, um, organization, have uh, skating, sledding parties, block party, you know, make it a community activity. This is a great opportunity to build community um, as well as take care of a problem. And then again, just know your limits. So if you have trees in an area where the, where the caterpillar hairs are gonna cause a problem and you cannot remove the webs either due to hazardous situations or populations that are too high, either in number or the height of the tree, then recruit help from tree care professionals. And those include licensed arborists and licensed pesticide applicators. And we do have lists with both of those available on our website. And we encourage you to recruit that help as soon as you know that you need it. So if you find yourself in June knowing that, oh my gosh, I've got a lot of brown tail moths, we encourage you to reach out to somebody even though you wouldn't do the treatment at that time so that you can line up that help for the following year. Because one of the things about brown tail moth is that the demand on those professionals is higher than the supply of those professionals, especially folks who are experienced in mitigating the problem. So we do encourage you to reach out as soon as you know that you need the help. Um, you know, in August and September, you might be able to start recognizing the feeding damage of those summer larvae the ones that hatch in, in August, um, you can reach out at that point for help uh, throughout the winter, really from October through, you know, now and beyond, you can recognize that you, you need help in managing the problem. And then I also want to recognize that any, not everyone can or would choose to manage brown tail moth. And so I do wanna cover some other measures that can help reduce the impacts. For many, there are periods of intense populations where even these measures will not alleviate significant impacts to your lives. I understand that. But the ray of light is that brown tail moth outbreak conditions are temporary. And even during an outbreak, the worst infested areas will shift. So it is a temporary problem in a given area. So how else do you live with brown tail moth? You want to avoid those areas that are heavily infested if you can. You know, one of the things to consider is to remove reduced maintenance schedules to exclude people, pets, and livestock from really heavily infested areas. Avoid activities during dry and windy conditions where you have high populations that haven't been managed. To dress the part, so cover up, wear a broad-brimmed hat if there's a if you're out during periods where the caterpillars are active because they can drop from the trees and those uh, that broad brim can help to stop them from landing you on you. You know, mitigate the hair activity through wetting things down before you do things like yard maintenance. And also another thing that folks have said work for them is to use pre-contact poison ivy products to help close your pores and reduce the infiltration of the hairs. Filter the hairs. You know, there are allergen reducing screens that are small enough to screen the brown tail moth hairs from your windows and also using HEPA filters in um, like a shop vac if you are uh, trying to clean up caterpillars or caterpillar bodies to help protect yourself from those hairs becoming airborne. airborne. You can try to create safe areas, areas where there are not infested infestations, but be mindful that if you have these dry windy conditions, those hairs will blow, blow around. And I guess I already covered use of the moisture to keep hairs down. So not only will this pass, but it is going to be back. 
Um, there's been some work done that, that indicates that it may back, be back worse than it has been in the past due to changes in our climate, most particularly the warming of the late summer temperatures. And so thinking forward, you know, well, first off, thinking about this year, lights out July, you know, the moths are flying in July. If you turn your lights off, will you still get brown tail moth in your yard? Yes. But what you might not get are those that are migrating from new areas. So brown tail moth, like a lot of different insect species, they'll sometimes make these dispersal flights where they'll lift up into the atmosphere and be carried uh, distances. And so if you keep your lights out, you won't be attracting those additional moths to your yard. And then looking a little bit further into the future, you can think about tree removal. It's not something that we generally recommend just because of brown tail moth, because brown tail moth is temporary, tree removal is permanent if the trees are in the right place. So when we think about landscaping, we think about getting the right tree in the right place. If you have a tree that's a problem tree in your landscape and it's infested with brown tail moth, definitely think about removing it and think about removing it in the winter uh, so that you can also destroy those webs and have that reduced exposure to the hairs. If you can't remove it in the winter, don't have it removed during that caterpillar active period. Think about doing that sort of in that later summer period when you have fewer of those toxic hairs that you'll be adding to the environment. And then again, looking forward, you can think about species composition. You know, there are some hardwood trees and shrubs that are not as favorable for brown tail moth. They include things like maple, although you will get infestations in maple, um, and also some of the ericaceous shrubs like your rhododendrons and azaleas. Um, some of the birch don't get as heavily infested as others, so like your yellow birch and your river birch, those sorts of things. Um, but as you're thinking about adding things to your landscape, think about making that landscape something that is less favorable to brown tail moth. And of course, conifers are not favorable to brown tail moth. And the final R is, is reach out. We basically encourage you to reach out to others in your community. There is not a doubt that brown tail moth is terrible, but by working together, we can help to reduce its impacts and, and maybe even make our communities a better place as well while we're doing it. So that's kind of my brief overview. I wanted to open to leave some time available for sort of a more open discussion. I also do have what I call a deeper dive here where you can choose your own adventure. If there's something in particular you wish we talked on more, then we can cover that as well. But looks like we probably have a lot of uh, questions in the chat. And so um, I'm happy to take those questions. Thank you so much, Thank Allison. You so much. That was amazing. <laughs> Um, we, we definitely have a ton of questions in the chat box. Um, thank you all for, for sharing your questions and we will get to as many of them as possible during the rest of our hour here. Um, there was a question um, and I, I've mentioned it a few times and people are continuing to join, but there will be a recording of this presentation if you're just joining now or if you've just joined um, recently um, in the last few minutes. Um, and that recording will be on the Blue Heritage Trust YouTube page, as well as the Blue Heritage Trust website and the Island Heritage Trust website, probably within the next week. But if you can't find it, feel free to email me um, or Lisa from Island Heritage Trust, and we can both put our emails in the chat box if you want to copy and um, hold on to those. Also, if you're interested in the PDF, um, that Allison mentioned, so you can um, see her slides and, and click on the links. Um, just email me because I have a copy of that um, at lander at blueheritagetrust.org and I can send you a copy. Um, and yeah, let's let's start looking at the questions. Allison, okay. would you like Lisa and I to like comb through them and ask them for you? Would that be helpful? That'd be super. Thank you. <laughs> cool. Okay. Um, oh, and just one more quick reminder. Um, today, I, I, it looks like we have a couple hands raised. And because we have such a large group, we're, we're not going to do the, the raise the hand feature today, even though we normally do that. Um, so put your questions in the chat box and we'll get to as many as possible. Okay. Lisa, do you want to start or? Um, uh, yeah, I can. I think I'm at the top, hopefully. I'm around 4 or 1 p.m. 
Um, so this person asked, we left a light on last summer by accident and we were able to kill hundreds the next morning. So we left the light on a few more nights and killed lots. Good idea? Um, it seems like it would be a good idea, right? You're killing dozens and hundreds, maybe thousands of the moths. Um, but as I mentioned, you will be growing additional moths to your yard. And what we have found in looking through light trap data that we have is that most of those moths that you're killing are gonna be males. And the way of the insect world is, and much of the natural world, is that you don't necessarily need a lot of males for the females to be successful in reproducing. And so, you know, if, if there was a way to attract those females to the lights, then it might be a, a, a more productive option, but with it being predominantly males, it really is not. Thanks, Allison. Um, so another question we have here early on um, is, do they uh, winter over in leaves remaining on trees after the fall leaf drop? Um, and is soil treatment or inoculation um, better to use? So they do overwinter in those webs. And so they, there's little tiny caterpillars within those webs right now. If you were to pull one apart, you could see them inside. Um, they begin building those webs in August. And so you can really start to see those webs come September. And obviously after the fall leaf drop, it becomes much more obvious. We do our winter web surveys, not until after January because, because that primary host, one of the primary hosts is oak and they hold on to so many of their leaves. It helps to have some of that leaf fall before we go out and do our roadside surveys. And then the question about soil inoculations, I'll say it's an option for some products. Um, if you're wanting to keep things more, you know, within the tree, then injections are a, a better option. But just remember that, you know, it's not really a closed system. <laughs> it's, it's, you still have, um, things that are being input into the environment. Um, so injections are an option. There are some soil applications. Most of those that I'm aware of are not actually available for homeowners for purchase. Um, and uh, in general, we really recommend that folks work with licensed pesticide applicators. It's a complicated pest to manage and uh, licensed pesticide applicators are trained and um, have the knowledge to do it do it well. And when you do hire somebody, or if you do decide to hire somebody, we definitely recommend, you know, following up on references and, and making sure that you're you're working with somebody who has experience in managing brown tail moth. Okay. Um, <laughs> here's an additional question. Uh, is progress being made on the development of a commercial product from the naturally occurring fungus, which is the brown tail moth's natural enemy? Yeah, so that, that actually, there is no progress on a commercial product for from the fungus. Um, and there's no work on it either. That is something that would require a fair amount of federal funding for that to occur. Um, and it's, it's just, something that's not, it's, there's not a great history of being, of us being able to harness the fungus at, of many insects um, for management. An example is um, what's now called the spongy moth. The European gypsy moth has a uh, similar uh, fungal enemy. And um, that one was also introduced into the United States and it was spread around through soil and those sorts of things. There's lots of reasons that we don't spread around soil <laughs> at this stage in our knowledge. And it is really effective in, in keeping those populations down during moist springs. Um, but uh, if it's dry as it has been recently, then you still end up with outbreaks as we have now in Western Maine, uh, where we had 55,000 acres of defoliation last year. Um, there has been some work on developing a virus, the bacular virus. But that project um, basically was uh, tabled, I guess, when the scientist who was working on it retired. Um, and so that's something that we'd like to see you know, start up again um, because it is another very targeted option. It's something that there, there is a record of success in, in um, developing products from the virus, viral diseases. 
Thanks, Alice. Thank you. Um, so there's a question, or, or somebody had um, said that they had spread compost around their trees this past fall, hoping it would help the trees fight the brown tail moth, and they're wondering if you think that it would. Yeah, so, you know, healthy trees, like healthy humans, are going to be better at, at fighting off um, problems. So helping helping your trees in that fight is, is good. So if you're in a period with dry conditions, then we recommend supplemental watering. If you have ornamental trees or fruit trees that you, you can do that for. Um, nutrients can also help. Um, you gotta be a little bit cautious sometimes with nutrients and pest species, but in the case of brown tail moth, it should be should not be a problem. It's, it's more of the sucking insects like your aphids and your scales and those sorts of things where nutrients can really work against you. Okay, um, this question is, I heard the smoke from burning the caterpillars can cause a rash, is that true? So one of the, I guess, only <laughs> nice things about the caterpillar um, hairs and the toxin within them is it is broken down by heat. So unlike poison ivy, you should not get a rash from the smoke from uh, brown tail moth hairs burning. Interesting. That's good to know. Yeah. Um, so let's see, here's another question. And I just want to say that if, if we pass over any questions, it, it might be because Allison has had already covered them in her presentation. But if you feel like um, you, you would like to hear again, um, just feel free to put the question back down in the chat box. Um, so this question is, I've heard that sometimes people spray oaks to get rid of moths. Oaks host so many beneficial caterpillars. Do they die too? So yeah, your, your management for brown tail moth, if you're using an insecticide, it's going to kill the other insects on the trees. And depending on what type of insecticide, it may just kill the other caterpillars or it may kill you know, the hot, a broad host of, of uh, insect orders. Um, you know, examples of pesticides that are less broad spectrum are um, BTK, and so that is a Bacillus thuringiensis Kristakii. It's a product that's derived from a bacterium and the Kristakii formulation or strain, I guess, is Lepidoptera specific. So it's gonna be caterpillars. And another thing that's important to consider is mode of action. So like with BTK, it actually needs to be ingested in order for it to be effective. And so if it's that you have pesticides that are active through contact, active through ingestion, those sorts of things. Um, and then another consideration is how persistent is it? So some treatments will persist in the tree for a very long time and others will have a, a short time of persistence and that's going to impact how many um, insects are impacted by the treatments. Um, so there's a few questions about washing clothes um, whether or not the hairs remain, if it's okay to dry them outside, dry them inside, use heat. <laughs> Do you have any recommendations? So my recommendation would be to, to dry them inside and use heat. Because as I mentioned before, the, the toxin is broken down by heat. And so I would run them through a hot dryer for the full cycle. Like really, <laughs> really keep hot water, them, high, them warm. Yeah. Um, Great. Um, so somebody's saying here that they have dumped the soap soak nest into the ocean and they're wondering if that is advisable. Um, well, <laughs> it, I don't know, depends on what they were soaked in, <laughs> you know, it's putting soapy water into the ocean, I don't know. <laughs> I guess dilution is, is helpful, it's, it's probably, it's probably enough to kill the caterpillars, I guess, but they could wash up somewhere else and then <laughs> emerge. <laughs> um, there are questions about if you discover caterpillars in June, can they be killed? And someone else asked if the caterpillars are climbing up their house, does it help to flip them into a jar and dispose of them? So I guess essentially, can you dispose of caterpillars once yeah. So the first question, if you've discovered the problem in June, can they be killed? Yeah, they can. Is it really effective in alleviating the problem? It, 
unfortunately, it, it really isn't. You already have a lot of the toxic hairs in the environment already. And so we generally don't recommend treating at that point because you're not gaining a lot from the perspective of your health and nor is the host tree or shrub going to gain a lot in this perspective of its health. Um, it's better to you know, wait it out, evaluate what's the population look like, you know, after you, the caterpillars hatch in August. Um, I mean, in July, you can, you can actually identify different of those. Was there a second question? I'm sorry. No, I think that was essentially the questions. Um, and another one, Allison, um, is are normal window screens not good enough to block out hairs? Normal window screens will not block out hairs. And so if you're in an area and you have, for instance, some big oaks that are gonna, those hairs are gonna blow into to your, your house if you have your windows open, then you know, thinking about how are you going to live with that? Are you going to, oh, I see my mic is fading in and out. <laughs> are you going to um, keep your windows closed? Are you going to invest in, and I believe they're pretty expensive in allergen you know, filtering screens. Are you going to, how, how are you going to handle that, that reality, I guess? Um, how, are, are you okay, Allison, that we're just continuing to throw questions at you? Yep. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, I see one um, suggested treatments for the rash. Um, so there's a number of home remedies. Some of them work, some of them don't. Um, and I, I really hesitate to provide any um, <laughs> medical advice since it's definitely not my, my forte. Um, but uh, so this is information from um, basically uh, Maine CDC or maybe it was poison control nurse, um, basically that there is no specific treatment. If you have trouble breathing or swelling of your throat, mouth, or tongue, call 911. Um, there are a number of different resources. You know, 211 is if you're not having this severe medical reaction, you can call 211 for advice. Um, the Poison Control actually also has experienced uh, folks with brown tail moth or folks who are experienced with brown tail moth. Um, I guess that's all I got <laughs> on there. Um, so, so basically when you're treating the rash, you are treating those symptoms. And uh, you know, there's a whole number of different remedies out there. If it's severe, then certainly, you know, 911 if it's very severe, and if it's you know persistent, then the physician advice is really the best way to go. Thank you. That's good. Yeah. Um, somebody asked, can you see the hairs and what do they look like? Um, so the hairs are tiny, the ones that are actually toxic, you can't see them. They're like microns long, um, but they, they look like, and I wish I had the picture here, <laughs> but they, they are, um, you know, basically just tubes and they have multiple little barbs at the, at the bottom of them. Let's see, so many good questions. Um, <laughs> uh, so somebody's asking, are brown tail moths a food source for any native birds or animals, particularly during the winter? Yeah, so there's some evidence and I think I, I have a little bit in here about it. Um, so there's some details in Paul Schaefer's dissertation about uh, the natural enemies. And he reported 32 different bird species that were predators of brown tail moth um, in North America, so not in their native range. And actually that in Russia, that birds are really important when brown tail moth are in low populations over winter. So they're actually making an impact over winter. Um, so, the larger caterpillars are probably gonna be targets of birds that specialize in hairy caterpillars. So there is actually a great um, blog by Maine Audubon on the cuckoos 
and they're kind of interesting in that they like actually are able to regenerate their stomach lining, I guess. <laughs> they sort of regurgitate it and regenerate it when it becomes clogged up with those hairs. Uh, but the smaller caterpillars are probably uh, targets of uh, a greater variety of birds. Okay, we've gotten some questions about professionals and who is available and how to contact them. Okay. Um, um, you're able to address that. <laughs> so I, I do have a couple of slides on, on um, the different types of professionals. So, um, you know, arborists can help in clipping webs and removing trees. And uh, each company is going to be a little bit different in what they offer. So some companies have you know, folks that can um, access webs from a bucket truck or something like that. Some folks have specialized lifts, lifts that can get even higher up in the trees. And so they can treat higher trees from, again, from a lift or bucket truck. Others have climbers. So there's a, there's a whole range of different services that might be offered. And the best way to figure it out is to reach out to folks. Now, we do have a list of arborists on our website that have said that they want to be on that list, and they provided a little bit of information about where they service and also how tall a tree that they can treat, um, but it's not an exhaustive list of all the arborists in the state because some have decided they don't want to be on that list either. They, they have plenty of, of work already <laughs> um, or for other reasons, they, they don't want to be on that list. So it, Variety of services, I guess, is the, the main thing, and that we do have that list, and there's also an arborist program. And then the other is the licensed pesticide applicators. You know, basically, they are able to provide services to apply pesticides in legal, effective, and safe ways, um, and that uh, they're able, those, those that are experienced, knows kind of the ins and outs of, of treating brown tail moth. Um, and again, we do have a list of licensed pesticide applicators on our website. It is not an exhaustive list, again, um, but again, they have provided information about what areas they will service and what types of trees that they can treat. Thank you, Allison. Um, so somebody from Penobscot is wondering, um, they, they said they're surrounded by land and tree growth, primarily oaks, and that last year, they saw 40 to 60% canopy loss in the surrounding 100 acres. And they're wondering if there is financial assistance for tree growth property um, and if spraying near the water is okay. So for forest stands, um, it's the treatment, the sprays is really not tenable unless you're looking at a, like an aerial application of pesticides. And that's probably unlikely um, to happen. There are not financial assistance programs available at this point for treatment. Um, and I'm sorry, I thought I silenced my phone. <laughs> um, so um, I guess what was the other? The, the other thing I wanted to speak to was the, the defoliation. Um, and there may you may get repeat defoliation this year. The problem that we're experiencing right now in Maine is that brown tail moth is one of many stressors. And so with uh, drought and brown tail moth, you may see more tree damage than you would otherwise. Um, brown tail moth will tend to hop and skip over the landscape a little bit and doesn't tend to hit the same trees hard in consecutive years. Thank you, Allison. Okay, uh, let me see. Somebody asked, do entomologists know why the brown tail moth population crashed in the early 20th century? Is the cycle likely to repeat? Um, so I don't think that we have uh, the answer. We have theories as to why it collapsed um, the, in the um, early 1900s. Um, you know, there was a really huge effort to um, you know, cut apple orchards that had been abandoned, to clip webs out of the trees, 
to introduce biological control organisms, to do pesticide treatments, and um, you know, all of that may have contributed. In addition, there was a definite evidence of the fungal disease taking hold around that period as well. Um, and also uh, a, a concurrent outbreak of the spongy moth that um, may have made the host trees unsuitable for brown tail moth. So there's, there's a whole number of different theories out there. Are we likely to see it again? What is likely to help collapse the outbreak would be again, the fungal disease um, and other diseases taking hold. Um, so Dr. Grodin from the University of Maine did some work looking at climate and, um, and brown tail moth populations. And in addition to seeing, you know, the populations were related to, increase in populations were related to warmer temperatures in the late summer and early fall period. She also uh, noted that the decrease in populations was related to um, wet weather in the spring. And so, so really pointing to those diseases being important and helping to bring the populations under control. Thank you. Yeah, that's really good to know. Um, somebody's wondering if uh, the brown tail mouth caterpillars overwinter on house surfaces or house surfaces or anything else aside from trees. They will not overwinter on house surfaces um, or anything aside from within those winter webs. Um, they may deposit eggs on houses and buildings and those sorts of things. You know, they have a really super will to live. And so there's a possibility that some of those eggs deposited on those surfaces may, you know, the caterpillars may hatch and, and be able to find a host tree, but those should be lower risk than those eggs actually deposited on the undersides of leaves. If you actually, if you look at a winter web, you can almost always find the egg mass attached right to the web as well as, well as the caterpillars inside. And then what was the other question? Other part of that? Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think you covered it. I'm pretty okay. sure. Yeah, just if caterpillars overwintered on house surfaces or any other surfaces aside from trees. Okay, somebody's asked for people who have dogs or other animals who are outdoors, what can we do to keep them safe and clean so they don't bring hairs inside? And how best can we treat our landscape in a way that won't harm them? Yeah, so it that's, can be really difficult. Um, the, we've talked a little bit with the state veterinarian about impacts to pets. Um, and she has said that, you know, basically those areas that are not covered in a lot of hair are areas that might be sensitive to the brown tail moth hairs in general. Um, they don't get reports of, you know, ingestion of, for those sorts of things like their dogs and, uh, and other pets eating the caterpillars. Um, but if you can exclude them from infested areas, that's a good approach. If you can create a safe space, um, the, uh, as far as treatments, you know, the, the, if they're looking at treatments with a pesticide, you know, making sure that you're understanding the label um, directions. And um, again, working with a licensed pesticide applicator who understands the safe and effective and also legal application of pesticides. Um, and then as far as bringing them indoors, I mean, I have a colleague who uh, swears by wiping her cat down with a, a wet cloth before he comes inside. Anytime that he's outside, he goes out on these walkabouts on a leash and uh, she'll wipe them down. And she's highly sensitive to the hairs. And reports that that's pretty effective for her and, and not, you know, getting exposed to the hairs. Good to know. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, someone's wondering if you could just do a quick recap of the key things that can be done to prevent um, brown tail moth and when the best time is to, to do this. Um, let me think. <laughs> uh, as far as to, to prevent it from um, landing in your yard or <laughs> prevent exposures, I guess. Um, 
you know, one is the landscape. So they're going to be in trees that are suitable for infestation. Uh, there's there's no real way to prevent an outbreak. Um, brown tail moth, like our native spruce budworm, is a species with cyclical populations. And so preventing an outbreak is not, not really possible, at least with the knowledge that we have right now. Um, reducing the likelihood of it getting to your yard, you know, it's those, you know, turning off the lights in the um, July, uh, month, of, month of July, throughout the month of July, or at least reducing those outdoor lights, you know, if you can go from something that's all on to motion sensor or something like that, that's, that's one approach. Um, as far as another another thing um, that I wanted to highlight, and I'm glad the question came up because I forgot, um, is uh, you know think about where you're parking in June and July, especially if you're in an area you know that is not infested, or if you're in an area and infested and you're moving to areas that are not infested. So this picture here is outside of the Bangor Airport, mm -hmm. and this crab apple tree, as you can see, is is pretty heavily um, loaded with brown tail moth. You mean some of these kind of look like they might be eastern tent caterpillar webs, but they are actually brown tail webs. And um, if you park your car there for an hour or something, you may end up with hitchhikers uh, coming back home with you or going to new places. A lot of times we, we see that. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't really quite understand the question. So hopefully I addressed it. I think that was awesome. And um, we will have the recording of this webinar. So if, if people want to like review kind of what, what you've shared, they, they can go back and look at the recording as well. But I think that was perfect, Allison. Okay, um, this question is what keeps them alive through the winter? How cold does it need to be for them to freeze or die? So they're kept alive by their, their adaptations, really. So lots of insects are well adapted to overwintering. Brown tail moth is one of them. Um, they are, we have not really seen significant population reductions in overwintering mortality surveys that we've done. Um, they, the cold winters really don't seem to impact their populations. Now, last year we found webs in Fort Fairfield whether which is in northern Arista County and and whether that would be a place where they would thrive uh, we really don't know um, certainly they were found near that latitude during the 19 teens but um, winter mortality is not likely to be a good um, ally in managing ground town moth populations um Another question, are the moths more active at night or the daytime? The moths are more active at night. So they, their peak flight is sometime somewhere between 10, 10 o'clock and midnight. Um, they're, they're night flyers. Okay, and this question is, do we have any ideas about one, what one can do with their own health to reduce susceptibility to brown tail moth hairs? I, I really don't. I mean, the only things that I can kind of harp on, I guess, is protective measures. So, you know, those poison ivy wipes, folks who've done research with brown tail moth have reported that they seem to, to help, you know, not the post-contact poison ivy wipes, but the pre-contact pre poison ivy lotions. Um, you know, similarly, uh, when in the 70s, when folks were headed to Cape Cod to look at populations. They would suit up in like a disposable or in coveralls and then put Vaseline around their wrists and their neck to prevent hairs from getting in. So, you know, just really making sure that, that you're reducing the areas that are open for exposure. Thank you. Um, so we have just a couple minutes left. So we'll, we'll take a few more questions. Um, one of them here is, if you never cleaned your house, how long would pathogenic hairs persist? I don't know exactly how long. Um, we do know that they can last, that the toxins can last at least three years. It is a very stable toxin in the environment. And so sometimes folks will get exposed to the hairs when they're cleaning out their camp or cottage. 
in the spring, even though there's not caterpillars uh, around at that point. Um, so they, they, toxin is persistent. And so that's why it's important to follow precautions, even if you don't have active populations, but you had them in prior years. Okay, uh, somebody asked, are gypsy moths as large a problem as brown tail moth? From a tree health perspective, they're a worse problem, <laughs> but from a human health perspective, they are not as bad. However, their hairs are still irritants and folks do report both rash and respiratory problems with the hairs from, from those caterpillars as well. Hmm. Interesting. During outbreaks, primarily, you know, generally we don't get any reports outside of an outbreak of, of those issues. Awesome. Um, Allison, I don't know if you've had a chance to see, but there have been a lot of thank yous in the chat box um, for your wonderful, amazing presentation. Um, so just want you to make sure that you um, heard that from someone. Thank um, you. And let's see, any other questions here before we sign off? Um, what site is a good place to go that has good photos that help us to identify the stages? So um, I guess on that, I don't know if I can, no, I can't do that. On the, the knockout BTM site, uh, we have a section that shows um, the, the life stages of the insect. Um, so that's, that's one place to go. Um, yeah. <laughs> Awesome. And Allison, so that is on your, um, your website? That's right. Yeah, it's main.gov slash DACF slash knockout BTM. Um, it's main forest service website. Okay. And then we do have a new page on there that's kind of an overview of management options. It's more geared towards cities and towns, um, but folks may find it helpful for their own, you know, dooryards as well. Awesome. That's super helpful. I tried to take down some notes with um, some of the resources that you you listed or like where to find an arborist or, um, you know, for, for the cycle of the brown tail moth. And I will put links at the bottom of the recording that we have on YouTube so that um, if you go back to that recording, eventually you can click on the links. Um, also, again, feel free to um, email me or Lisa. Um, Allison, I don't know what your capacity is to accept emails right now, do you, do you wanna share that information or not? So, I mean, certainly people can reach out to me um, the, or the forest at maine.gov actually reaches our administrative assistant. And so there's, you know, four additional entomologists or three additional entomologists that can answer those questions as well. But I I can put my email into the chat, I think. Cool. Right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Allison, I also noticed that you have that picture on this last slide where it says you can call 211 for any brown tail moth questions. Is, is that that group of entomologists you're talking about or is that a separate line? No, 211 is, um, is actually, it's basically the same resource for like, you know, public health type of, of questions. So they have a contract with CDC and they are um, basically have pretty similar resources to what's on our website. So. It's a, a, not a great place to call if you've already read all of our FAQs, <laughs> but if you have a question and you just want a quick answer, then 211 is a good place to go. Awesome. Wonderful. Well, this has been really, really informative. Um, I know I have learned a lot and people are saying in the chat box that they've learned so much. So Allison, thank you so much for joining us tonight and sharing your yeah. knowledge. Um, which is incredible. <laughs> you know so much about the brown tail moth um, and for answering all of these questions. Um, we I'm really- Happy to do it. And you know, again, I'm just really happy to have the support and raising awareness about brown tail moth um, because I mean, nobody wants anybody to have to suffer through that. Absolutely. Yeah, well, thank you all. Um, for those of you who are, who are still out there in, in the audience, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, if you have questions, reach out, um, look for the recording if you wanna share it and good luck um, dealing with, with brown tail moth this year. <laughs> thank you. All right, have a good thank night. Thank you, Allison.